everything old is new again. America's entertainment pop culture talk show. It may well possess a rudimentary intelligence. I'm trying to think, but nothing happens. I felt a great disturbance in the force. Hello, I'm Mr. Ray. Come on, Mark, I got a job for me. Where's the goodies? Leave the gun. Take the cannoli. I bet you wouldn't have done anything like this if Mom and Dad were here. You filthy criminal. Excuse me while I whip this out. Go ahead. Make my day. Here are your hosts, Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. Earth is our home, but only so long as it keeps us safe. When this world can no longer serve that purpose, another planet, another colony, another chance. The rest of human history begins now. Ah, welcome to Everything Old is New Again. That was the trailer for the first season of the new Netflix hit Lost in Space. In case you missed it, all 10 episodes of season one were released on Netflix in April. So you've got time to go back and look at that. And if you've been listening to Everything Old is New Again, you know that we're a big fan of that show, uh, old and new, Lost in Space. Uh, but uh, this new reimagined incarnation uh, of this classic Irwin Allen show is not to be missed. I'm here with the ever-excited David Cullen. Yes, I'm excited because, Doug, this week we have the privilege of welcoming one of the people responsible for that project, one of the executive producers of the new Lost in Space. Ah, but wait. Listen to this. This is a coup. The fans of Everything Old is New ago, get new uh, our show, let's say, uh, know that we devote at least four shows a year to UFOs or unexplained phenomenon with uh, our resident uf ufologist, uh, Dr. John Viviani. Well, this week we welcome the executive producer of Ancient Aliens. But not only that, Doug. <laughs> this week, we also have, as a guest, the executive producer of one of our favorite shows and ratings king of Tuesday Night Cable, uh, the the Lagana Brothers continuing search for treasure on or historical artifacts on Oak Island, which has been renewed for a sixth season. Be pretty crowded in our studio if that was uh, three people, but believe it or not, that is one person, Emmy Award winner, and our special guest who have more uh, credit then we can list here. We're only an hour show, so we'll we'll stop there. But uh, happy to uh, enjoy uh, the presence of Kevin Burns. Kevin, thank you for coming. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you, and I could identify pretty much every little clip in your opening credit sequence. Oh, you know what? We should make that a uh, like a contest a quiz. And, uh, yes. yes, I'm glad that you can. We're I, I have I'm, read. I'm old enough to I'm old enough to remember every single clip. Isn't, wow. Isn't that great? I mean, that, that shows works right into, like, you know, how our show basically strives to honor the past and enjoy entertainment of the present and look uh, to the future uh, of entertainment pop culture. We recognize that most of our entertainment today, as you probably know, is based on the foundation of what's come before and seeing that you're quite a, a history uh, in that regard and you know <laughs> all of those uh, those clips. Uh, you're also associated with uh, Annie's biography, a number of Irwin Allen projects, including Poseidon, and of course Lost in Space. Uh, something tells me we're we're on the same wavelength, I guess, huh? Uh, well, I would like to think so. I also did <clears throat> one of my infamous shows for E Entertainment was The Girls Next Door uh, with Hugh Hefner and his girlfriends, which, believe it or not, I based on Petticoat Junction. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and and then we we did a spinoff show with Kendra, one of the three girls, and I based that show on Bewitched. So everything I do is based on my childhood watching 60s television. How about that? And, and I recognize uh, that show was a, was a guilty pleasure, we'll say, the, 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 uh, the girls next door. And they sometimes did wear those short shorts uh, that the Petticoat Junction girls wore. Well, I, I mean, let's face it. What, what better place to put Hooterville than at the Playboy Mansion <laughs> with old Uncle Joe, who's moving kind of slow. There you God go. Bless him, which, God bless him, was kind of few after at the time. Exactly. Sure. So, and it all works and, and it all goes back, like you say, to the 60s and, and, and we we love um, taking a look at that era and we've done quite a number of shows you've heard and haven't heard uh, uh, we, we've talked about Ren Ir Allen and his uh, and our fascination, if you will, with his work and Poseidon Adventure and so forth What um, inspired you to get involved with all things Irwin Allen? Because what I understand, you have a, a pretty good uh, connection now to his uh, surviving legacy. Well, you know, it, it really started when I was a kid. My three favorite shows 
when I was 11 years old were Lost in Space, Batman, and The Monsters. And, uh, I mean, I just loved all three shows. I used to draw pictures all the time. I used to do Lost in Space comic books. I used to draw pictures of the Munsters and send them to Fred Gwynn, who used to send me little pictures back, which was a big deal for a kid growing up in Schenectady, New York. So it, it really inspired me to kind of be, you know, a creative person and to, and to draw and to get involved in and maybe think that I could one day do television. I had a little girl neighbor of mine who lived behind our house and she and I got very close and her father was a television writer in the 60s and he actually was one of the writers on Lost in Space and later wrote Star Trek and lots and lots of other stuff. His name was Cary Wilbur and uh, and again knowing just that kind of a connection when you grow up far away from California, far away from Hollywood and you have that connection between writing to Fred Gwynn and knowing the daughter of one of the writers of Lost in Space, it really kind of compelled me. And so when I had a job years later working on working on uh, at 20th Century Fox, which was the studio that did Batman, Lost in Space, Star Wars, Planet of the Apes, Alien, all these science fiction shows that I loved, uh, not to mention all the other Irwin Allen shows like Time to the Land of the Giants, Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, I was in heaven, and I started uh, developing ways to promote those shows. I created a documentary division that would create documentaries that would uh, be on Sci-Fi Channel, like the Fantasy World of Irwin Allen, and it led to a very, very close friendship with Irwin's widow, Sheila Allen, and eventually uh, another Fox executive and I formed a partnership where we worked with Sheila, and she entrusted us with her husband's legacy, and that legacy exists today right up to the Netflix Lost in Space. So we've been working on trying to get Lost in Space re re renewed and reimagined as a television show for the better part of 20 years. Now, uh, and, I was yeah, going to say you did a terrific job on what I think is an overwhelmingly, on the outside, looking and difficult project of or task of recreating uh, a classic uh, in, in Lost in Space. We'll focus on that just for a moment here. And I've seen, you know, Jonathan Harris, who, who was the original Dr. Smith, speaking previously, and he spoke about uh, Kurt Kasner and, and talked to Kurt Kasner, and, and who, who was Alexander on Land of the Giants, and, and, you know, another character that was similar to Dr. Smith. And he, and he told, you know, Mr. Kasner, Apparently, listen. It's foolish uh, to try to imitate me uh, and to into what I do. It's it's impossible. Do your own thing. Now I don't know if he did that or not. If it was successful or not. But the reason why I mention it is now we've got Parker Posey trying to uh, embody the character of Doctor Smith. But I, in my view, doing it, of course, from the first season, serious Doctor Smith, but doing it in in such a a classic, or I would just say, it's such a great way that it's a, a character you love to hate, and it's got a different spin on it. So it really is interesting the way that you're tackling Doctor Smith. I would say. Well, that was all deliberate. I mean, uh, you know, I, again, not to take any credit away from uh, the showrunner, one of our you know, other executive producers, Zach Estrin, or the writers Bert and and Matt Bert. Burke uh, Sharpless and Matt Sazama, who developed this property with John Jashney and myself. The ideas that are kind of the foundation of this new lost space really were things that John and I had been working with uh, several years ago. I mean, we've, we, we had the rights to Lost in Space back in 2001, after New Line's movie, when the rights reverted back to Sheila Allen. And we tried to do a TV reunion movie featuring Jonathan Harris in the original cast, and Jonathan passed away. And then we uh, took a, a run with the WB Network. We tried with CBS. We, we brought in a lot of different writers, and we learned over the course of time what, what to do and what not to do and what was important to do. And, and so when John and I brought Matt and Burke in, uh, the writers uh, of the pilot of The New Lost in Space, we said, look, this is a tough nut to crack. And because if you look back at the original show, there were almost three different iterations of the show, technically four. There was the very serious, unaired pilot, No Place to Hide, that did not have Dr. Smith and the robot in it. There was season one, which was much more action-adventure, 
much more kind of serious kind of Twilight Zone space adventure uh, featuring the family. Season two was much more of a fantasy show, very kind of comical with Smith and Will and the robot. And then season three was a little bit more balanced between those elements, but it was still very much a fantasy. And that was deliberate. I mean, even Erwin Allen would not necessarily have called Lost in Space science fiction or as it was really science fantasy. So when we went with Matt and Burke, we said, look, you have to kind of decide which Lost in Space you want to make. And we recommended that they go back to the original pilot. They go back to season one. Unfortunately, we're going to have to stop it right there for a moment. We'll be right back on Everything Old is New again with Kevin Burns talking all things Lost in Space. You're listening to Everything Old is New Again, America's entertainment pop culture talk show with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. We're back on Everything Old is New Again talking to Kevin Burns about the new Netflix Lost in Space. You based it on season one of the original. Now, what direction did you give to the writers from there? We gave them our, what were our favorite episodes, which were about 15 different episodes from season one. And we said, this is where we would like the show to live, where Smith was a much more plausible villain, but still inventive and clever and kind of fun to watch. Uh, We said we're open to Smith being a woman because we really don't want someone trying to imitate Jonathan Harris. We don't think that that's a very smart strategy for somebody to either try to do Jonathan or somebody to deliberately not do Jonathan, which I think would kind of kill the fun of the character. And, uh, you know, we said, look, we're open to the robot being an alien robot. We're looking to for, uh, we think that the family, given that we're looking 35 years ahead of where we are now, not 1997, but like 2040, uh, that this could be, uh, or, you know, that, that the family could be a mixed race family, but giving the characters some kind of a backstory to play, which is why Judy is the product of a relationship that Maureen had before the show. And that wasn't meant for political correct reasons. It was meant to just reflect where the American family will probably be in 35 or 40 years. So we made some strategic changes that we offered to the writers. The writers embraced them and then came in with their own ideas uh, and some brilliant ideas. Uh, And then we developed it with uh, Neil Marshall, who directed the first two episodes. We developed it with Zach. We developed it with Netflix and Legendary, uh, Peter Johnson at Legendary. So it was a team. But but, and even the idea that Smith, uh, Parker Posey's character, actually steals the identity of the quote unquote real Dr. Smith was something that we came up with uh, to take a little bit of the sting out of the fans who would say, well, why did you make Dr. Smith a woman? And we could say, well, is that really Dr. Smith? And the fact that Bill Mooney got to play that character of the, quote, real Dr. Smith was an even more delicious layer. So great. we're very proud of what we accomplished. We think it's the perfect blend of the best of the original show and where audiences want to be today. Yeah, and I think it was, uh, you know, a, a, I'm not going to call it a shock, but it was so interesting to see what is going to happen with this character and Parker Posey does have a comedic background so you wonder and it's always in the back of your mind in some way will there be any kind of a turn or a a little bend towards the comic side or not I don't know if you can release that information or not but it sounds like no I, I don't know is there a possibility of her to put a smile on her face here and there or no well, I think she does think already, she does. if you yeah. want to know the truth. I think there's something kind of delicious about her kind of crazed madness. I mean, she, 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 I think she brings a lot of the colors that Jonathan brought to that character. Mm-hmm. And she grew up loving the original show, which was something we didn't know when we brought her in. But, um, but I, I knew when they suggested her in casting that she was perfect for that role. There were other people uh, who were suggested who would not have been as perfect as she is. I think the casting in every respect of the show is perfect. I think that Toby Stevens and Molly Parker and uh, the the people who play the kids and Ignacio, um, the biggest risk, of course, was the robot. 
Right. Uh, because, you know, again, I love the original show, and I was, you know, I, I remained close to the surviving cast members. I was very, very close to Jonathan. Uh, I was with him the day before he died, mm. and uh, and I, you know, and not that I can speak for Jonathan, but I know pretty well the things he would have said. Kebby, you blew it. I don't <laughs> like this. Or he would have said, "Oh, she's wonderful. I love Parker Posey, and she's <laughs> not doing me, <laughs> and that's that's acceptable." And of course, you can't get me, so it won't be as good. But she's uh, not bad. It's a good and impersonation. I, that's how good. That's how Jonathan would have been. He would have been Parker Posey. Not bad. <laughs> At least he got the chops. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, he so, was a character, I'll tell you. And and most of what he said, he had a little bit of bravado. But you know what? Most of what he said was right on the mark. He he was so unique and so iconic. It really was a huge task. I never lie. <laughs> I mean, Jonathan was such a tremendous character. You know, he told me. Uh, I don't know if you ever heard this story, but he said, "You know, they send me scripts, the fans." They send me scripts from all over, and of course I never read them. Uh, he said, but I'm always very polite. I answer all my fan mail, and he said, and when they send me a script, I write them back very politely. I said, thank you so much for this wonderful script. I shall waste no time in reading it. And then he said, and they can make of that what they will. That was so, uh, and he was a great writer because he wrote, from what I understand, all of those barbs against the robot. He bubble-headed booby and all that. Am I wrong? He he came up with most of those, didn't no, he? Not? Well, uh, of course, of course, the writers did do a lot of work, and they and they were writing to his character. But he did rewrite virtually every line of his own dialogue. <laughs> and 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 on the things that I did with him. And Billy and I, you know, we did Lost in Space forever. And it was such a tremendous uh, thing. We, we did this promotional film for New Line uh, to tie into the movie and the classic show. And John Larroquette hosted it. And Billy and I worked on it. And, uh, and I wrote this gag where Jonathan and Billy and the robot would reprise their roles. And, you'd, and we'd get to see them one more time in costume. And it was so much fun to do, and it was such an honor to do when we rebuilt what we could afford to rebuild of the interior of the Jupiter II. And uh, I wrote the first draft of the script, and Billy wrote his own draft, you know, like we worked together, and we presented it to Jonathan, who, of course, then took all of his dialogue and changed it. <laughs> and, nice. um, of course. And it was better. And it was better. Well, that is a case where, uh, excuse me for saying, but, you know, uh, the the actor many 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 times we've seen it in Star Trek and other shows where the actors try to participate in the writing of their character and sometimes it doesn't work. I think in this case um, he had such a grip on what he was doing because let's face it he created that it wasn't written that character wasn't written to be that way. So I guess we could say he knew that character better than anybody. But he was a pretty creative writer. Well, it was interesting because a lot of the original cast, you know, and I not to speak out of turn, but if you read the Mark Cushman books, which are he did three volumes on the history of the original show, which are pretty extraordinary and extraordinarily well researched. And uh, and we we gave him access to Irwin's archives because because we have everything. We have all of Irwin's papers, all of his letters, all of his scripts. And um, and and Mark did a very deep dive and turned up some stuff that was very interesting because a lot of the original cast felt that their roles had been kind of pushed aside. Uh, for Jonathan, because that's what Jonathan did, like Jonathan pushed them out. Well, that's not true. Uh, what was very true was that the show that Irwin envisioned, uh, which is very much closer to the Netflix show, by the way, uh, which is why Irwin and Shimon Winselberg got a credit on the very first episode, um, saying that it was inspired by their script, No Place to Hide, which was the unaired pilot. But Irwin's original vision was the space family Robinson. It was the Swiss family Robinson in space. CBS put it on at 7.30, which in those days was for children. I mean, it was when Batman was on and the Munsters were on and all and the Flintstones were on. And um, so CBS saw it as a children's targeted show, and they didn't want kids to be scared. And they felt that the first episodes, which I loved as a kid, I mean, I was nine years old when the show premiered, but, um, but I loved the original show, but CBS thought it was too scary. So they kept pushing it to be less and less scary. The children should never be in peril. 
and they and Smith they really ordered that Smith not be as menacing or as deadly and couldn't spend every week wanting to plot to kill the family. So, which of course was uh, made a lot of sense. And Jonathan didn't like that either. I mean, Jonathan didn't want to play, uh, you know, a kind of a one-dimensional villain. And so he and the writers and Irwin kind of conspired to kind of make it a more humorous, clever character, primarily because the target audience was kids. I would say that in the Netflix case, we have a little bit more latitude because it is definitely a family show and it's targeted to families, but it but it also can be a little bit spookier and darker than the original show was. So, so we're kind of going back to what Irwin would have envisioned, and I think we've done that very well. I, I agree with that, and we're here on Everything Old is New Again with Kevin Burns. We'll be back uh, to talk all things. Uh, uh, maybe we'll take a look at, at Ancient Aliens and, and Curse of Oak Island, as well as uh, Lost in Space and some other topics on Everything Old is New Again. We'll be right back right after this. That's why I'm doing your show because when I saw the title of it, I said, oh, "This is this is a platform, man." So, oh, I love it. That's ter- that's tremendous. I appreciate that with Dr. Weller. The idea, uh, maybe you can explain uh, on the air here what you think of of the show, or at least the concept of our show. Well, the the attraction to do the show was the uh, the, the context of realizing your past and your history, and not just sort of honoring it like doing a Fred Astaire memorial, but to contextualize the past subsequently so that we don't make the same mistakes or that we have a guidepost. You know, all the things I've been talking about is like, it doesn't matter whether it's myths or whether it's history. Those things fascinate me because my PhD is in Renaissance Italian art history and how to look at paintings and the way, for instance, just for what I teach kids, it's like the way you're going to look at this painting here is exactly the way they looked at it back then and way you look at a movie now. You know, so all that stuff that, that's stuff that we talk about what's entertaining in movies is the same thing that entertained people in the past about art and so everything is old everything is, everything is old is new again it's history man it's a you know it, I, when I, the second I saw it I said this has got to be a history show uh, yeah and pop it's culture show. even though it's pop culture history you know pop culture it, back in the day uh, guess what the renaissance art was the pop culture of the day so uh, let's yeah, not you gotta put see that, that like yeah but you know wow you know what everything in its day is pop culture and I'm so happy to have had you. I wonder, maybe we'll have you back. We'll put you on the spot at this point, if you're welcome to, anytime you like. No, no, David Cohen, uh, Douglas and Viana, you guys are my new heroes, so I'll come back whenever you want. You're listening to Everything Old is New Again, America's entertainment pop culture talk show with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. Eddie, the lesson I want you to learn is it doesn't matter what you look like. You can be tall or short or fat or thin or... Ugly or handsome, like your father. <laughs> uh, you can be black or yellow or white. It doesn't matter. But what does matter is the size of your heart and the strength of your character. Oh, welcome back to Everything Old is New Again. That's Herman Munster from the 60s Munsters. I'm here with David oh. Cohen. How do you like oh. that? Yeah. <laughs> and we're... Oh, goody, goody. Goody, goody, goody. There you go. Another great invitation. <laughs> we're here with, uh, with Emmy Award winner Kevin Burns, who, who is involved with and executive producer of so many shows that you know right now, Ancient Alien, Curse of Oak Island, Lost in Space. But I want to take a turn here, odd turn for the listener maybe doesn't know, that there was a pretty interesting relationship between uh, yourself, Mr. Burns, and uh, Fred Gwynn. And I just wanted to, first, before we get into that, is what was is and was your fascination or enjoyment of the monsters so much? We've, we've talked about it number of times let's hear your position on why this was so interesting to you i thought it had great heart as we just saw and heard but it also had such a unique idea and such fun and that's what we're trying to do is bring some fun to the radio tell us am i on the mark or where where were you on this show oh i I, it was my favorite show along with lost in space and batman and uh first of all i was a visual kid i loved anything that was visual and the 60s television was the most visual decade in the history of television. I mean, everything was so spectacular. I mean, they didn't have the CGI and the special effects that they do now, but they made up for it with imagination. And if you think about it, you know, you couldn't have done those shows on the radio. You know, television was transitioning from a radio-based medium in the 1950s where it was kind of like 
visual radio drama to a, a totally cinematic interpretation, which was like little mini movies. And so I loved all the old monster movies. I loved Frankenstein and Dracula and the Universal Monster movies, and I would read famous monsters of film land, and I'd paint Aurora model kits. And of course, then I hear that there's a TV show coming on based on Frankenstein and Dracula and the Universal Monsters, and I was totally keyed into it. And then I started drawing pictures of the monsters, and I, as I mentioned before, my mom read an article that said Fred Quinn was an artist, and he was an illustrator of children's books, and, uh, and she thought, well, maybe he can give you some ideas on what to do. Maybe you should send him your artwork. And I was kind of reluctant to do that, but I did, and, and uh, Fred Quinn wrote back to me. So if I didn't already love the Munsters, which I did, now I really loved it, and I, I, I collected it. I, you know, if it was my birthday or a holiday, I would say, I want Munsters, Munsters. And I saved quite a bit of it, and I have an insanely huge collection now. I'm actually looking at Grandpa's electric chair, which sits in my living room, which is a little intimidating for me to come over to visit my house. Oh, uh, wow. The best thing that I could say is that I have the old lunchbox from the 60s, and I'm proud of that, but holy smokes, that blows us all out of the water. Uh, how did you get all of this? I know you asked for it, but how do you, as you pr- progressed, I guess, with your career, you became more, uh, the, the, the tentacles went out, you were able to, to find some of these, uh, these great, this great memorabilia, I guess, huh? Oh, it was actually up on eBay. It was at an huh? auction house, and, and I, and it was a, it was in Los Angeles, was selling it, and it had been, Used in a lot of different things, both before the monsters and afterwards. But it was definitely Grandpa's chair, and uh, and it needed a little bit of restoration, but I, which I did, and uh, and I've actually been able to feature it in a couple of TV things that we've done. But it's really, it's it's cool. I mean, I have a pair of Fred's boots. I have a couple of his headpieces. I have Yvonne gave me her necklace, wow, uh, wow. The, the bat necklace, and it was the one that she wore all through the second season and in all the movies. And, you know, so I have some really treasured items. I got to be, I, I actually knew Fred a little bit. I would write to him and I would speak to him and I had, you know, I met with him a few times, but I got very close to Al and Yvonne DiCarlo and Butch Patrick and Pat Priest, uh, who, of course, I still talk with. And, uh, but, you know, that, that connection, I mean, I have to say, I was just with William Shatner the other day. For a kid from Schenectady, I got to meet all of my heroes as a kid. I got to work with them. I got to hire them, uh, and uh, which was really a dream come true. That's amazing. In, in, in a parallel universe, you could be hosting everything old is new again instead of us in, in that way. Uh, and That's or if you, that's why I'm on it. <laughs> I, 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 I would also say that if you're looking for a, a job for as a producer or a guest uh, a coordinator, feel free to give us a ring. Uh, <laughs> but along those lines, we, we've had um, Paul Hecht and Bob Caliban from CBS Radio Mystery Theater, if you remember that show, I know, uh, you know, in the oh, yeah. 70s. And they spoke about Mr. Gwynn, like they would have him on the show. Uh, well, they would be acting with him together, and then they would walk uh, their separate ways in New York City and have, uh, have a conversation or two with him. Uh, just to give us a little idea, if you could, they were praising him and couldn't say anything uh, negative at all, which is great to hear uh, about no, Fred he Gwynn, was, you know? He was a- he, he was a wonderfully, first of all, he was a brilliantly talented man, and he was a tremendous artist, tremendous actor. Um, but he was, you know, I will say this, and, and, and I, I say this both because I, I got to know his family a little bit. I did his biography for A&E, mm. uh, and I, uh, but he was a very unhappy man, by and large. I mean, he was, he was a, he, you know, he had a very... Um, you know, he had troubles with a couple of his children, who well, one of them was handicapped, another one died in infancy. Hmm. In other words, there was a lot of sadness in his life, which I think informed his work. And and um, and it's not true. I mean, I will say this: the, one of the big lies about Fred Gwynn is that he hated Herman Munster and he hated the Munsters. Um, the fact is that he took it on as a challenge. He wanted the show to be better. I think he and Al felt that the scripts could be better. But they loved doing it, and I think they loved creating that role, which, again, was not on the page. Like Jonathan Harris and Dr. Smith, Al and Fred really took very two-dimensional characters based on the original scripts, and they created this kind of Abbott and Costello, Mutt and Jeff comedy team with Al as the straight man and, and Fred as the kind of big, bumbling child. And... uh 
and Fred took his mother's laugh or his mother's voice. That Frederick, Frederick, that's not very nice. Uh, that that was Fred's mother, and he took the prop man who worked on the show. He took his laugh. That <laughs> that's hysterical. <laughs> that wow. came from the Fred man. The, the, and he loved Herman Munster, and he loved the soul of Herman Munster. You can't do that part as brilliantly as Fred did it without loving that character. But I don't think he was prepared for the typecasting that happened afterwards. Mm -hmm. And he, and it was very hard for him. You know, he loved doing Car 54. He and Al had both been in that show. They worshipped Nat Hyken. They thought he was a, an incredible genius writer, which he was. Um, and they and Fred and Al really, really loved each other. They became very, very deep, close friends. But in the 70s and 80s, you know, Fred struggled, you know, both on stage and in film to kind of break free of the stereotype. And uh, because it was very hard for people when they saw him in a movie like Cotton Club or Ironweed to not point at the screen and say, you know, Herman Munster. Right. In fact, he did this uh, a brief but very notable part in a Bertolucci film called Luna with Jill Clayburgh, where he plays her husband at the beginning. And uh, Fred actually told the story to me of when Bertolucci cast him in Luna. He said, well, Mr. Bertolucci, you may not really want me in this film because, you know, in America, people know me as Herman Munster. And he said, you not worry. After me, they're only going to know you for Bertolucci. <laughs> they will not know you as Big Green Monster. <laughs> and, uh, of course, I don't know that that was very successful. <laughs> but I would say that by the end of his life, when he was doing My Cousin Vinny, and, uh, you know, Fred really was embraced as an actor's actor. And I think he really had a soft spot for Herman Munster. It's just that he didn't want to be overly identified. And, and when you listen and hear him on the old, he did about, I think about 10 or maybe more radio mystery theaters where you're, you're just hearing voice. Uh, and some actors really can do this well and some have a, have a struggle with it. You could hear. Uh, I'm not saying that's the seminal work of his career, but I'm just saying in, in, even in the dark times, you could hear his acting chops. Uh, they gave him a lot to do in many of the shows. It was just him and maybe one or two other actors, and he really carried the day on those shows beautifully. And uh, and I think, like you say, with my cousin Vinny, when you, you hear him for the first moment, oh, uh, now I know who that is, but he, that character he created, you, you go, certainly go beyond that. And I'm, I guess that's why he, uh, at, at least the, towards the end, was felt a little more comfortable. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, he, you know, uh, it, it was an incredible part. You know, I think all of these actors, Jonathan, I don't think this happened to Jonathan, but I think every one of these actors, whether it's Leonard Nimoy or Fred Gwynn or Bob Denver, who was Gilligan, who creates these, uh, you know, indelible parts that are very hard. You know, Don Knotts is, you know, Bar Barney Fife or, you know, Fonzie or any of these TV characters that become almost a catchphrase, it's almost like they have cancer in the sense that they go through all those stages of denial and, you know, anger and bargaining and, and ultimately acceptance. I'm sorry, we're going to have to interrupt right here, Kevin. We're going to come back right after this. We do have a hard break here and we're enjoying it. Very interesting discussion with Kevin Burns. We're going to continue talking and maybe we'll take a turn and go to the Curse of Oak Island and Ancient Aliens and more right here on Everything Old's New Again. Come on back. Now, back to America's Entertainment Pop Culture Talk Show. Everything old is new again with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. We're back with Kevin Burns. We're completing a little discussion here about the Munsters and Fred Gwynn. Uh, and uh, just want to continue this and ask you, Kevin, why are these actors who play these iconic characters, uh, why do they shy away from these characters they're so well known for? Because they, they don't want to admit that that's the character for whom they're going to be best known, and some of them just embrace it. Now, Jonathan, for example, had been an actor for many, many years, a character actor, a supporting actor. He'd been in two previous television series before Lost in Space. So when he became a star because of this role, he loved every minute of it. He that. never wanted to shake it, because by that point, he had lived a long enough life and career that he was kind of like 
this was the cherry on top of the Sunday as far as he was concerned. Plus, to me, on some level, to attain the uh, status of, let's just say, an iconic character uh, like any of that you just mentioned, you have to have been and be a terrific actor or comedian to begin with. Um, but I guess, uh, you know, that's somewhat lost when you want to do the, the next project. But I think we forget, you talked about Al Lewis. I want to play one small little clip here because uh, this may uh, put the icing on the cake as to uh, how and why people do what they do. Find something. Not that you want to do, that daydreaming. The need has to be as strong as a junkie's. See, a junkie doesn't want the drug. He needs it. Big difference. The one thing is a kid wants a bicycle. This lady wants a mink coat. This guy wants a Jaguar. He wants a Mercedes Benz. Those are daydreamers. You have to need it. That's the strength, the adrenaline. But my need is to perform. I'm a junkie in that sense. That's why. I do what I do. There we go. Uh, Al Lewis, I don't know if you could hear all of that, but the... Oh, no, 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 that brought, that brought a tear to my eye because I got to know Al, as I said, very, very well, and he and his wife, Karen, and, and his sons, and his first wife, Marge. I, You know, Al was very much a family man. He was a character totally self-invented and bigger than life, and Al, that's used a lot, but Al was absolutely the epitome of that character. But isn't that something where you that quote kind of blows me in a way in a way in some way because you have this anticipation of what this character actor or the person is in real life and you somewhat it, the character bleed in your mind bleeds into the person but boy was that well said and was that uh, meaningful and shows the depth of an individual of course you know better than I do uh, of Al Lewis huh Well Al was Al read a book a day. You know, he was a very, very uh, well-read character. Um, I mean, he was a, he was a very um, he was beyond liberal and progressive. I mean, Al was a radical. I mean, there, there, he was his. I went to his memorial service in uh, Harlem, which was a spectacle. I have to tell you, because he was such a New York character. Right. But he lived an amazing life. I mean. You know, when he said things like, Charles Manson used to babysit my kids, and uh, and he had Black Panthers have meetings at his home, you know, at, uh, right after the Munsters, he wasn't kidding. Um, now, what he did do, though, is he lied about virtually everything in his life before the Munsters. Um, he, he totally falsified his story. He claimed he was born in 1910. And when I did um, his biography... His son, Teddy, uh, who has since passed away, and he was a wonderful guy, but Teddy said, well, which version of the story do you want us to tell? Yeah. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, Pop said he was born in 1910. His birth certificate is 1923. Oh, and I said, why would, you, why would your father add 13 years to his age? And he said, because he likes to be told he looks good for his age. <laughs> and that was just one of the, one of the many whoppers I mean, he claimed he had a Ph.D. When we did the biography, it all kind of came out. What, what he really did is he was a, a guy from Brownsville in Brooklyn, um, and he taught special needs kids for many years before he became an actor in the 1950s. So he came to acting a little late in life, but he also claimed he was older than he was. And, um, and, he, and he gave himself a more interesting resume, and he was... Uh, you know, he was a fascinating character, but he, uh, uh, and very, very colorful and very opinionated, but, uh, you know, in my experience with him, he had a heart of gold. And he, he had a very strong character. And he took uh, that uh, character beyond uh, the monsters and did many other things, including one episode of Lost in Space, of course. Um, yes, and, and one night, one night I, I hosted a dinner, it was just the three of us, for Jonathan and Al and myself, oh, wow. because they were both guys. I mean, Jonathan was from the Bronx. Al was from Brooklyn. They were both self-invented characters. I mean, when I met with Jonathan, I said, where did you get the British accent? He said, oh, no, I'm not British. I'm just affected. <laughs> and uh, he, said, he said, I used to talk pure Bronx. D huh? These dems and does, he said. He said, I knew that I could never get arrested as an actor, and I would watch British movies and learn how to speak. 
And I said, that's for me. And I thought, you know, again, extraordinary, both of them. And I had dinner with them one night, and they had done Lost in Space together. And they just were, like, best friends. And, uh, I mean, it was an extraordinary evening. I only wish I had taped it. Hmm. But, um, but it was wonderful to see how how they got each other because both of them had come out of real poverty. They were both uh, uh, Russian-Jewish immigrant kids who were born very poor and who totally created their own persona. And, uh, and when Jonathan died, Al took it very, very hard. And, uh, and I remember speaking with him many times about that. And he, they really loved each other, and they had only worked together the one time. Wow, that's an, it just shows the, the character that, that they had to be able to create uh, what they did create for us to talk about some 40 and 50 years later. And we are coming to the end of another show here, unfortunately. Uh, but we have been privileged to have Kevin Burns agree to come back next week on Everything Old is New Again to continue our discussion. And we have talked about the new Lost in Space, which he is the executive producer of on Netflix. Check that out. You're not going to be disappointed. Certainly, I'm sure you have been watching and will continue to watch Ancient Aliens. And along those lines, I'm sure we will have Dr. John Viviani back. Please email us at oldnewagain at aol.com, oldnewagain at aol.com. If you'd like to hear the doctor come back and continue discussing uh, the updates, the latest updates in UFO and unexplained phenomenon, but certainly watch that on uh, Ancient Aliens as well, which is executively produced by Kevin Burns. Finally, The Curse of Oak Island is back. I don't know if you've been watching this one, and this is a pretty good show where you're watching grown men dig in, dig and dig and dig with big machines and Tonka toys, and uh, guess what? They're finding some things that are very interesting unearthed there in Nova Scotia. So take a look at that. Upcoming, we have Chris Difford from Squeeze. If you haven't uh, heard Squeeze, don't know who Squeeze are, I think you do. Tempted, Black Coffee in Bed, Songs like that. Paul Carrick has been playing with them in the past. Uh, I tell you, you, you you're not gonna you're not gonna hear a better band from the '80s that's still going to this day. So we're gonna have Chris Difford, who is the songwriter, uh, co-songwriter with Glenn Tilbrook from Squeeze on the show. We're gonna have Peter Weller back, the most interesting man in the world, as we say, and we're gonna enjoy a nice uh, conversation with Peter Weller about acting and directing. Maybe what's the best director of all times? He's directing some films, but he's directing mostly television shows and having a great time doing that. He's certainly acting in shows. There's a couple of shows that he's in right now that we will talk about when he's on the on the show we've mentioned uh, radio mystery theater when we talk about talking about fred gwynn and if you're looking for old shows we did do two shows with paul hecht and bob caliban on everything old is new again they're from radio mystery theater they did over 400 shows between the two of them on Radio Mystery Theater. So if you look at our website, it's all, everything old is new again dot biz, everything old is new again dot biz, and you will find right there all you need to know about our old shows, and you can find our old shows on Radio Mystery Theater and more on everything old is new again dot biz. Upcoming, we're also going to take you to some parlor games and see if you can, I don't know, if you want to join us, a.k.a. Dick Van Dyke style. We're going to do that. We've got a lot of fun new shows coming up with David Cohen here. But we'll be back next week with Kevin Burns talking Lost in Space, Ancient Aliens, Curse of Oak Island, all currently on TV now. Oh, <laughs>